Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. Well, it's been a holy grail of sorts, the search for carbon uh, neutral energy. But there's a very interesting company that might just have made a breakthrough. I'm talking about Terraform Industries. There's a lot that they've been working on over the past uh, couple of years to try and develop uh, a pathway to carbon neutral energy source and carbon neutral gas. Well, I'm lucky to have Casey Hanber, who's uh, heading Terraform Industries, here with me on Over the Horizon today. Also with me, Ozan Bellick and Scott Walter. Welcome, all of you. It's so wonderful to have you and to talk about, well, is this finding the holy grail, Casey? That's the plan, and thank you for having me. Pleasure. All right, so before we get into the, into the technical details of what's going on, Help us understand what is this all about? Because there's, you know, um, there've been articles written about it. There's a lot of excitement about what this represents for a cleaner, more abundant future in terms of energy. There's a lot of potential, but what does it really mean? What does it do for a wider audience? Break it down for us. Yes. Well, I mean, at, at its core, what Terraform Industries is here to do is what. A lot of our economy in the past uh, and our industry has been to do, which is to increase the amount of affordable energy that is available for humans to use in an infinite variety of ways to improve their lives. And the, the key, of course, is you know, making that work in terms of technical detail. Um, and the way that we've chosen to go about doing that is to take advantage of uh, you know, a series of fairly stunning advances uh, in terms of solar electricity. Um, and, and in particular, for those of your listeners who are unaware, solar electricity has gotten more than 10 times cheaper in just the last decade, which is almost unheard of uh, in terms of you know, any precedent in any technology development in human history. Um, and we can take advantage of that by uh, you know, using that solar energy through our grid uh, to, to run our electrical appliances. But we've found a way to take that solar electricity and convert it into hydrocarbons. Now, hydrocarbons represent about two thirds of humanity's uh, energy supply. Um, and, uh, and obviously their continued extraction from the crust uh, of the earth puts CO2 into the atmosphere, which is causing long-term climate challenges. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the oil and gas underground is limited and it's expensive to extract and it's expensive and dangerous in some ways to transport around the world. And it also creates strategic and geopolitical vulnerabilities. Um, and so we need to find a solution to this uh, sooner rather than later. And our approach is to take that ultra cheap solar power and and then we take CO2 out of the air and we can take water and we can take the water out of the air too if we have to and, and chemically convert water and CO2 uh, into natural gas and ultimately other hydrocarbons uh, in basically the same way that plants do, only because we're not constrained by having to be a living organism, uh, we can do it at, at far, far higher efficiency and far lower cost. Uh, and in fact, so cheap that we believe we can compete with drilling as a default source of hydrocarbons for humanity and our industrial economy. Um, and you know, if we're able to pull this off, it's going to change everything. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. So I assume this includes the entire cycle, right? And this also means generating energy that is required for this process um, in a renewable fashion, and that would be solar, I imagine. Yeah, we're actually agnostic about energy source. Um, we don't mm -hmm. mind uh, if we, I mean, we, we test with power from the grid, which in Los Angeles is mostly solar power during the day anyway. Um, but we can, we, we, you know, We've explored projects using wind. Uh, we're open to using nuclear power, geothermal. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what source it is, provided it is cheap. Uh, and so it's really a race to the bottom as far as the electricity input cost goes. And you know, we've we've bet most of the farm on, on solar getting there first. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't make a huge difference for us. So, so you're saying it doesn't depend, I mean, the, the this cost competitiveness versus drilling is independent of the the or the type of energy or the source of energy and the cost at which uh, you're you're sourcing it well ultimately because we're making an energy product and because we're dedicated to providing the best possible value for our customers we found a way of building machinery that's able to pass on about 80 percent of the cost saving from cheap electricity uh to the customer in the form of cheap fuel this is super important it's a widely overlooked fact um but if you're trying to do uh, you know, an ultra cheap energy product and you're betting on solar continue to get cheaper in future. You know, effectively, you're creating an arbitrage, uh, you know, where you're, where you're trying to, to short the future price of solar electricity. It's really important that you use a lot of it uh, and that mm -hmm. you, you, you don't care that much about electrical efficiency. You care about capital efficiency. You care about 
about achieving the best possible value. Uh, and so in that case, yeah, it's really critical for us that we we get access to the cheapest possible electricity. And um, and I think, well, I'm, I'm definitely on team solar. Of course, uh, many other people have different opinions, but um, but it certainly seems to me that that uh, solar is the one to beat when it comes to you know reaching around about ten dollars per megawatt hour, um, which we think solar will reach uh, pretty soon. It's actually yeah. there are a number of um, developments in the Middle East which are like ten bucks and change uh, for uh, for one megawatt hour of, of electricity, and that's AC, and we we use DC, which is actually quite a bit cheaper. Um, yeah, so, so basically, there already. So yeah. ten megawatt hour, uh, ten dollars per megawatt hour. That uh, we're talking about one cent per kilowatt hour, and that's uh, what uh, that's a lot lower than what people are, are used to seeing on their electricity bill, regardless of whether they're yes, that's right. using solar well, or, do, or not. And, it, it and, may, and, like, it may shock you. I, yeah. Yes. So I, I you know, I, I think like those of us who know know that there are a whole other lot of other costs associated with uh, distribution and load balancing, um, but I, I don't think a lot of people are aware. So if you could maybe. Uh, talk a little bit more about where does, uh, uh, you know, consumer, uh, where do consumer prices come from in terms of that? And why, why, you know, why haven't we heard that solar has gotten so cheap and why is rooftop solar so much more expensive? Yeah. Well, rooftop solar, uh, just to kind of dispose of that one quickly, uh, it's relatively expensive in the United States for, I think mm -hmm. basically regulatory reasons. Um, you know, Australia is, uh, is where I'm from obviously, and Australia has the cheapest rooftop solar on earth. Uh, it's like three or four or five times cheaper than the United States. Uh, and it's not like Australia is someplace where like labor is magically cheap, uh, and materials are magically cheap. If anything, you know, Australia's economy is significantly less developed than us, uh, across almost every axis that matters in this case. Um, I think it's just a choice. Uh, and you know, the Australians for better or for worse figured out how to, how to make rooftop solar cheap, uh, you know, Quite a, quite a few years ago, um, but um, but in terms of you know the price you see on your bill, well, what you're paying the the uh, the, the local utility for, which is after all a regulated monopoly, um, is you know essentially they, they they supply a bunch of electricity and then they divide their costs by the amount of electricity they provided, and that's your bill. And so their costs include all kinds of things. Um, it includes the, the cost of building and maintaining infrastructure. It includes the cost of, of building, operating, maintaining legacy power plants. Um, they also, you know, obviously procure electricity from from solar developers. In some cases, they develop solar themselves. But um, you know, uh, it's got to the point right now, for example, where where uh, you know, in, in Los Angeles, for example, which is a, a very solar heavy city, um, most of the price that you're paying for uh, electricity is you know central distribution cost, uh, and, and in many cases like stranded asset, poorly maintained legacy uh, infrastructure distribution cost, um, which we we can kind of see. You know, like um, I don't want to name names, but uh, but there's a lot of utilities which are really struggling um, with maintaining the the kind of legacy, legacy transmission infrastructure, uh, and I, I actually predict that this problem is going to get worse uh, over time, just because the utilization of these um, you know, like long distance power transmission pipelines through rugged areas, et cetera, uh, is, is going to continue to fall. Uh, and so the revenue that, or you know, like the value that accrues to those assets is going to continue to fall. Um, and it's, it's a competitive industry. So it's a, it's kind of a, a structural challenge for these utilities. Uh, but on the gas side, actually, they're, they're, um, you know, we're happy to help them out. And uh, we've had many productive conversations with a number of utilities here in the United States and, and also overseas about how we can essentially help them meet their targets to procure a carbon neutral natural gas to supply their customers at, at you know, high value products that they depend on for, for heating and warmth and cooking and, and, um, and, and in many cases for industrial uses as well. That's awesome. So, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, one set per a kilowatt hour solar, uh, and, and this being cheap enough to have cost competitive, uh, synthesized natural gas. Yeah. Uh, now can, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, how, how that math works out in terms of, you know, on the, on the drilling side, we, we know that um, electricity generation with natural gas can be fairly cheap as well. How do you, yeah. where, where do the savings come from for those, for those who are dubious? Like I, you know, <laughs> I'm yeah. on board, I mean, but. <laughs> I mean, plenty of people are dubious and that's fine. I mean, like, obviously yeah. like uh, drilled natural gas is the, is the product to beat right now. And, and as far as like fuels go for humanity, it's really hard to hope for a better one. Uh, it's true that natural gas is in some ways more difficult to transport long distances than, than oil because it requires compression liquefaction, um, particularly for ships and things like that. But it's also significantly more energetically um, you know, advantageous. Uh, the energy density is quite a bit higher um, and, uh, and it's often, often cleaner, you know, fewer contaminants than, than oil. Um, it, you know, because it's a, a gas product, it's, it's relatively easy to refine um, and, uh, and its carbon intensity is about half of that of, of coal. Uh, so you know, in many ways, the decline of coal 
in the United States, particularly for electricity generation, has been has been driven by gas rather than by, by wind and solar. Although you know that story is not fully written yet, um, and that's one of the main reasons actually that we've we've sought out natural gas as our beachhead product uh, here because it's just something that where like we see many many decades of, of future you know very very robust growth uh, that we can service. Um, in terms of hitting that in a cost, well, you know if we look at the the, the, the kind of the, the facts of of producing fossil natural gas. Um, essentially, in order to profitably produce natural gas, you have to be in the right place. Uh, it does not occur uh, under most parts of the world. It only occurs, occurs in, in very particular locations. Uh, in the United States, you also have to become you know an expert at, at hydro fracking technology, which is is kind of very advanced and rather expensive uh, technique that involves uh, drilling holes into into reservoirs of natural gas and then and then fracturing the rock to allow it to escape in all kinds of ways and 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 then actually one of the things that we've seen in this industry over the last decade is that um there's been enormous gains in in, in efficiency and, and cost and, and technology there but they haven't necessarily accrued to the bottom line or not necessarily been captured and part of the reason for that is that um is that natural gas um you can net fract natural gas wells if you like um typically decline pretty quickly and so you don't have this like long tail of of basically uh free revenue uh, after you paid off the drilling cost to continue to fund you know ongoing exploration and drilling uh, and this is a real challenge for the industry uh, you know ultimately the industry is is a license to print money i don't think it's a major challenge for them in, in an existential sense um but i do think that uh, we're seeing early predictions now that that the current glut of natural gas in the u.s market is likely to to peak and then and then kind of go away in just a few years just as we saw in the uranium market in 2018 uh, essentially because um the you know increased demand for natural gas takes a few years to to get into order in particular uh, liquefied natural gas export terminals and so on for for uses in, in east asia and, and europe which uh do not have the same blessing the united states does when it comes to uh the abundance of, of locally occurring hydrocarbons um and at the same time you know to the, the crop of of natural gas wells that's doing all the production today uh will be i think mostly an afterthought within five or ten years um and that's actually you know again advantageous for terraform because it means that you know while it might be difficult for us to compete with you know a, a bunch of newly drilled gas wells in you know uh, i don't know marcellus formation or something um right now um you know in five or ten years that looks quite different um and and actually the economics of of uh you know drilling and gas development right now are you know obviously significantly more challenged than they were in the past uh in principle because of, of kind of geology risk and, and and the cost of finishing a well uh, we, we've, we've talked to independent producers for example who uh, kind of have to float 60 to 100 million dollars right now just to be able to drill and then complete wells and stay in business which is significantly more than than they were able to than, than, you know they had to have in terms of cash on hand even you know 10 or 20 years ago um we've seen you know tens of thousands of, of businesses of these of this kind go out of you know basically go out of business in the last decade uh in, in terms of this cash crunch so so that's kind of the supply side that's what we're competing against i mean fundamentally if you want to summarize it it's like well the the the, the gas and oil is, is deep underground. Uh, the rocks are hard. Uh, drilling through them is extremely expensive. It's not getting easier over time. You know, all the factors of production that feed into this are getting more expensive. Uh, and on the other hand, you have, you know, solar solar PV has come along as basically the cheapest energy that humanity has ever known. Um, you know, dollar for dollar, it's like a thousand times cheaper than food, um, which is kind of insane. You know, I have a family and feeding them is not exactly cheap, but um, but if I was able to feed them solar power, it would cost me like 50 cents a week to feed my entire family, um, which is which is kind of absurd. Um, but uh, but you know, in terms of what humans spend their energy on, at least in the United States, something like 99% of our energy is spent on our machines rather than on our children or our people. Um, and that's that's a good thing. You know, that's the reason we have awesome lives is because we're able to you know use most of our energy to, to use machines to do the work for us and achieve much higher productivity on a per person on a per person basis. So all this. Um, you know, the solar cost is coming down, you know, it doesn't really matter how we convert that into natural gas. Sooner or later, the solar will be cheap enough that we can we can make it into natural gas cheaper than drilling will be able to achieve. The challenge for us is, um, you know, how do we make that sooner rather than later? And in order to make it sooner rather than later, we have a, a kind of pretty um, unique uh, decosting strategy. But essentially, the key is like, well, we need to build a machine that performs this, this energy arbitrage that's able to convert between uh, initially just empty land, like land that's un economically unproductive that otherwise just gets hot in the sun. Uh, you put solar panels on top of it. Now you're generating solar DC power, but the solar DC power is not very useful in the middle of nowhere. You need to use it to do something. Uh, transporting that to market is quite ex expensive, as we discussed, uh, in the form of electricity. So if you're able to convert it into some other form uh, locally on site that is then you know, backwards compatible with existing usage modalities, existing distribution channels, et cetera, et cetera, then um, that's super useful. And so that's that's a machine. Uh, you know, it captures CO2. It makes hydrogen. It combines those two to create natural gas. Once it's natural gas, uh, here's, here's a lovely picture of it. Um, so there's like three three core components that we've basically stood up in the last uh, 18 to 24 months here in, in our facility in Burbank. Um, and uh, once it's natural gas, of course, you can basically 
go and buy off-the-shelf parts that allow you to take that you know to, to market through gas pipelines or trucks or or liquefied natural gas carrier tank, uh, ships or whatever uh, as the case may be but like but essentially everything downstream of like oh i've got natural gas in the middle of nowhere that's a solved problem because right now the way we get natural gas is we go out in the middle of nowhere and drill a hole in the ground that comes out of the ground so like essentially mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're just replacing that drilling step or like the you know the the, the pipe that sticks out of the ground with uh, a bit of machinery you drop off the back of a truck uh, that sits on the ground in the middle of nowhere and then uh, and then we can move that natural gas uh, to market but actually the super cool thing about this is you don't have to be in the marcells formation to make this work right if you happen to be i don't know uh, a, a a farmer in in japan who is is kind of looking at declining agricultural pro productivity and and you know decreased uh, importation costs of of the crops that you are producing compared to australia or something um then you're able to develop that land uh with solar power with you know cheap project capital uh, and suddenly the economic productivity of that land has gone up by a factor of 100 or 1000 uh, and then you're able to convert uh, that solar power into natural gas using terraform you know, industries machine uh, terraformer uh, and that uh, basically allows you to then you know essentially instead of producing some you know low value crop uh, in in a in a in a market facing serious headwinds you're now producing natural gas in a country japan uh, amongst you know probably 200 other countries on earth uh, that does not have adequate supplies of hydrocarbons within its own border Right. So if you're Japan right now, and I've spoken to you know energy ministers in Europe and East Asia uh, on this very matter, they're like, well, where are we getting our energy from? You know, like the, the galaxy brain idea 10 years ago was we'll just import it from Russia. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, we've seen what can go wrong. <laughs> the galaxy brain idea is like, well, I guess now we'll import it from the United States. Uh, you know, and we'd be competing with India and China uh, for uh, to get access to, you know, U U.S.'s supply, which is not infinite. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, the United States uh, is occasionally indifferent to the plight of its uh, of its uh, fellow nations overseas. Um, I think I think the key is to basically realize that, like, if you want to have energy security, you've got to be able to produce it within your own borders. Um, and you know, I think you know, historically France realized this, and they they built out their nuclear reactor fleet, and all power to them. Um, but you know, if you if you want to go to the next step and and ensure that you have you know, sufficient access to hydrocarbons, that you're able to continue to develop your economy in much the same way that the U.S. economy has really continued to develop in the last 15 years, and the European European economy is generally flatlined uh, at best since 2008. Uh, then you have to have, you know, a, basically an abundant supply of excessively cheap hydrocarbons uh, that you can depend on that being there for, you know, the next 10, 15, 20 years, a sort of time period that, that the major capital investments that you make to exploit this resource require to pay themselves off. Um, and that's an unsolvable problem. That's an unsolvable problem unless you have a way of converting cheap solar power into, into natural gas and ultimately oil and gas, which is, or, you know, oil and other fractions, uh, which is what we're working on with this uh, lovely machine right here behind me. Yeah, I was wondering if you could... Uh explain that a little bit to us because we're kind of familiar with something called the Sabatier process because it was yeah. made rather popular by Robert Zubrin is how to be able to produce uh, methane on Mars. And um, is it the same? It's a little bit different because I was noticing you've actually got hydrogen in there because the first thing a lot of people are going to say is, well, wait a minute, why don't you just make hydrogen instead? And the argument mm. is because we don't really have the infrastructure. Uh, if Let's say if you think liquefying uh, natural gas is difficult and transporting natural gas is difficult, wait till you get to hydrogen. The thing is, it's already really a solved problem for natural gas. We did it already. We have the pipelines that are set for being able to do it. So it's very That's clear right. you can do that. Uh, it almost seems like maybe what you're doing is you're you're using the methane in, in a sense as a way to store the hydrogen rather than going to, around that yeah, way. Yeah, that's right. But but methane is already you know very useful in many different places. And the big problem with renewables is they they always come on and off when is inconvenient for you. You need a way to store that energy. <laughs> One way to do it with batteries, but there's yep. no reason why you couldn't use other forms and like, especially if you need to produce some sort of fuel product uh, or That's you right, need yeah. it from somewhere. So now you say, oh, we don't have to drill holes in the ground. We don't have to worry about the pollution that goes with it. We don't have to worry about the fact that we're having to pay people three or four times the wage to move to North, North uh, Dakota to be able to do that. And yep. also we're not releasing that, that CO2 into the atmosphere. We're not having to deal with methane leaks. And so whatever CO2 you're kind of putting into the cycle, it's like, well, we're taking it out of the atmosphere in the first place. So it, it is definitely carbon neutral. And I imagine yeah. even the, you're going to have a certain amount of leaking, but I imagine the leaking you have is way less than what you have. Well, it's, it's uh, measurable and controllable. Yeah. Yeah. It's measurable right, so and like, controllable. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. like uh, this, this reactor, when we first built it, it leaked, uh, yeah. you know, all, all, all systems leak, all boats leak, all, all things yeah. leak, right? Uh, and that's actually the major problem with hydrogen, which is that like the consequences of leaking hydrogen is yeah. is is a huge problem. Whereas the consequence of leaking a bit of methane or CO two is like well unfortunate, but but actually you know it is true that methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than CO two. It's about maybe fifty times more powerful. So like if our leak rate is two percent or more, then we're going backwards on the CO two yeah. you know, climate problem. Yeah. Um, but you know a leak leak rate of two percent. You know if if we 
I don't want to like phrase this the wrong way, but we're good capitalists. We're quite greedy. We don't want to give two percent of our product away for free. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So so like it's or it's to our advantage to, burn it to, off to or control do that. Whatever. Like like yeah yeah and, to. and yeah our, our reaction vessels are running at seven bar. Like that's that's not exactly cutting edge in terms of pressure. You know, compared yeah. to what the SpaceX engineers do every day before breakfast, this is this is a warm up, and yeah. um and it's 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 fairly well understood how to prevent. Uh, that you know, from 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 leaking, and, and I don't think we, you know, our leak rate is. And, and I think the other thing, less than one psi per day or something, it's, it's yeah. almost nothing. With, with your mining analogy, like if you have an open pit mine, your your mine is constantly moving, so your equipment constantly has to move with it. If you're fracking, yeah, you got to keep on going somewhere else because your supply is constantly running out. So wherever your yeah, refiners are, right. they have they're constantly chasing this thing moving around. Whereas you're like, we're out in the field, the field's not going anywhere. <laughs> the reactor no. we can just put there. The supply lines at some point you could say. We start out by having to truck it in and out because that's the easiest way. But at some point, you say, if this is going to be permanently here, we can tap into an existing pipeline that might be nearby. Yeah, we so probably won't be trucking out. it. Yeah. So yeah. like for, for, for initial developments, it's most likely we'll actually be be plopping these down on top of existing coal mines or, or existing gas mm -hmm. production areas because it's already zoned appropriately and, and the infrastructure is already there and the, the production is declining. And and we can just you know basically plug straight in there. And the nice thing is our gas is... is um, you know, as far as renewable natural gas goes, like we we hit ninety seven percent purity. Uh, we announced that mm -hmm. recently. We can actually do quite a bit better than that. Um, that's unheard of, right? Natural gas that comes out of the ground is never ninety seven percent pure methane, right? It has to be post processed. Natural gas that comes out of renewable natural gas, like wastewater processing and so on, you're lucky if you're like thirty or forty percent natural gas on in terms of the raw product. Um, and so our gas is actually able to like decrease the cost of everyone else's gas by diluting the pollutants that are naturally occurring in other sources of gas. This is kind of the genius of the approach. And actually, you did mention Robert Zubrin, and I think I should probably give him due credit. Um, he's, uh, he's uh, obviously a super interesting fella and um, has actually worked himself in the natural gas business uh, through his company, Pioneer, uh, Pioneer Energy, I believe. Um, but um, but yeah, I read I read the case of Mars when I was nine or 10 years old. It was obviously quite formative. Um, and, uh, you know, I reread sections of it now and then, and, you know, we're just about to, to we're in the process right now of setting up a methanol process and, and methanol is described, uh, in the case of Mars, um, uh, in, in some depth. And, and so, um, you know, it turns out that, you know, the case of Mars is a, is necessarily a popular science book. Um, and, and some sections of it are kind of speculative or, or gloss over the details, but you can tell that, um, that Zubrin and his, and his collaborators at Martin Marietta actually did build a, a Sabadia reactor because when we built one we basically had all the same problems they described in the book in kind of a funny way um mm -hmm. basically like thermal control issues was like the the major major issue and, and I know that that uh, Zubrin and his collaborators bricked one or two of their catalysts and and we actually we, we're using a different catalyst uh quite deliberately but but also we're, we're optimizing right now for earth operations uh, and massive 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 scale whereas for Mars you'd be operating you'd be optimizing for you'd be op optimizing more for energy efficiency and mass efficiency which is not something that we really care about um, right. But yeah, this, this reactor you see here is a two-stage reactor. So uh, each each of the stages performs about a 90% conversion on the uh, gas stream that goes into it, which allows us to get 99% purity in, in, in two reactors. Uh, we have other other reactor prototypes that are kind of in the works that, that might simplify this uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, every every single time we build one of these reactors, we get about 100 times smarter than we were before. And this is uh, this is Gen 4 uh, of the reactor, or about Gen, Gen 3 or 4 of DAC, and about Gen 11 of electrolyzers. The electrolyzers, it turns out, are somewhat easier to, or somewhat faster to, to, to iterate. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, Sorry, it's for, a, it's for those who didn't reaction. follow the DAC is the director of capture. Yeah, uh, DAC is director of capture. Yeah, that's how we get the CO2. Do, do you want to see a, do you, do you want to show the, pull up the picture of that? Yeah. And, and yeah. I think the one downside I might want to point out about this is like the fact that you're not extracting it from wells means we are going to have an inadequate helium supply for party <laughs> balloons. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, no, actually, it's, it's kind of interesting because because there are some parts of the world that have like pretty enriched helium supply in in natural gas, um, and so I could imagine you could go prospecting directly mm -hmm. for that. Uh, I'm a fan of helium for sure. Um, it's such an amazing amazing gas. It's like I think the first element that was predicted based on uh, you know um, chromatography. Uh, analysis yeah. or like um, of, of of chemicals in the sun, and because it's such a, a small atom, you could actually you know, basically do the calculation of of the spectrum and be like, oh, this has to be something with a molecular mass of four, um, and then oh, it has to be you know the Nobel gas with a complete uh, yeah, uh, S, S, I, S1. I think it was discovered like shell. on the sun before it was yeah, actually discovered yeah. on Earth. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? Um, yeah. uh, one of my, I mean, I, I have too many projects, but like I, I just want like a beautiful coffee table book called The Elements, and and every, it's like maybe four hundred pages long. It's just got like two or three or four pages of every single element with like just the fine grain, ultra autistic detail on like all the industrial uses of vanadium or something like that. And that'd be that'd be amazing. Um, if you if you're listening to this and you can produce that, uh, let me know. I'll I'll, I'll pay a hundred bucks for it. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so so the Zubrin stuff is, is super inspirational. And actually, the the reason that I discovered, I kind of figured out we could do this, uh, was kind of twofold. But but one of the things that I think is is probably underdeveloped in Zubrin's published works um, is is the question of like how do you go from you know a couple of people exploring Mars to like the big Mars city really quickly. And I think um, SpaceX and Elon Musk have done a really great job of articulating you know why that is in some ways more more interesting and more exciting than like the Mars Direct flags and footprints. You know, a couple of people running around uh, for the same price. Um, oh, what a beautiful picture. Um, and um, and so I, was, I, I kind of got in, got on the bad wagon with this early on, and I, I wrote a book about industrializing Mars, and realized that the uh, kind of the major major challenge you have there is the synthetic hydrocarbon supply chain, because most of the work that the economy is doing in the early days, at least, is refueling starships to fly people home. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of an insane insane thing to say. It's like imagine if you got some you know uh, tiny island nation somewhere, and you're like, well, this tiny tiny island nation, like maybe Brunei or something like that. Well, mostly most of its economy, like ninety percent of its GDP. Is just producing methane and oxygen to fly rockets uh, back to Earth, um, and of course that's enormously energy intensive, which is quite challenging because Mars is not a place that has uh, an abundance of either naturally occurring hydrocarbons or you know uh, pre pre prefabricated uh, energy plants ready to go. But on Earth, that's not the case. On Earth, of course, there's plenty of energy, plenty of labor. This air is free. Um, the CO two in the air, obviously, uh, that's how plants grow. Um, so. Um, so I was like, hmm, I wonder if anyone's thought of this. And it turns out a few people had come across this before. There's a couple of you know, predecessor companies to our own um, who have basically attempted to take cheap electricity and turn it into fuel. And actually, the history of synthetic fuel goes back well, for about 100 years. Um, it was done in, in the interwar period in Germany, for example, uh, converting coal into liquids. And that's actually still done in South Africa today. Um, but in terms of like... Um, being able to uh, to make this work at scale cheaply really quickly, I think we cracked basically cracked the problem there, um, which is um, essentially basically just figuring out how to how to make these machines extremely cheaply, like kind of um, consumer electronics grade um, value engineering rather than like um, you know NASA space station level engineering, and that that's the key difference. Okay, so how does your process work? So it looks like you're uh, first splitting uh, hydrogen. Or hydrogen from water. Yeah. So if we if we pull up that that slide with the illustration on it, the, the black and white um, drawing. Yeah, that one. Okay. So this is a, a kind of a, a basic schematic of of what a terraformer looks like. Um, in terms of area, most of it is solar arrays actually. So like one of these requires about five acres of solar arrays to operate. Um, and uh, and the, the size of the system itself, if you can't see the numbers, it's like about you know two shipping containers or, or so of material. Roughly half of that by area is the electrolyzer. The electrolyzer um, is is a, a very simple machine. It's about as complicated as an electric kettle, um, and it takes in most of the electricity uh, and uses that electricity to split water, which is uh, H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. And we just vent the oxygen like trees. We just give it away for free. Uh, unless unless we have like a local user who really needs oxygen, there's not much point in us collecting it. Um, uh, in fact, yeah, I mean, there's just there's no there's no point. Uh, so we we take the hydrogen and and then as uh, as Scott mentioned earlier, uh, hydrogen is extremely difficult and annoying to transport. So we move it the minimum distance necessary uh, to our reactor, which is in the middle. Uh, and then on the other side, on the on the far right hand side, um, we have the direct air capture system. So in terms of area, that's mostly a giant bed uh, or absorption bed. It's like a duct. And we use a calcium uh, oxide, calcium hydroxide, calcium carbonate chemistry to capture CO two, which is by far just the cheapest and crudest way you could you can do this. It's the same chemistry as the um, as as like a rebreathing systems used in in, in spacecraft or submarines or uh, medical applications or scuba diving. Uh, and in fact, if you remember the scene in Apollo thirteen, uh, which is unfortunately not entirely based on reality, where they uh, realize they have to use the um, the CO two scrubbers from the um, command module in the lunar module, but they don't fit. Uh, and they have to like uh, plug them together with with some, like a roll of duct tape and a sock. Um, that's essentially those those scrubbers contain exactly the same chemi chemical that we use. Um, they capture CO two exactly the same way. Uh, the difference is that um, in the Apollo program, obviously once they were once they were full, they were discarded. Um, but in our case, we we take the chemical calcium carbonate and then we what's called calcinate, which is the same chemical process used to make uh, cement. Um, and that releases the CO2, which we capture. Um, and that's that's how we basically concentrate CO2, increase its uh, concentration by about a factor of 2,000 times from about 400 parts per million up to like 98%. Um, and uh, and then the waste material, calcium oxide, which is uh, lime. Um, so that's, that's the raw material in cement, by the way. Um, we then put that through a machine that regenerates it and turns it back into uh, basically a flake, uh, millions and millions of flakes that we can put back in the bed. But in terms of the life of a calcium oxide uh, molecule, 
Um, it spends you know, maybe two days in the bed absorbing CO2. It spends about five minutes in the kiln releasing CO2 and about five minutes in the solvent regeneration system, uh, becoming, uh, getting rehydrated, turning back into calcium hydroxide and then being put back in the bed. Um, and that's, yeah, it's just a process that we use to capture CO2. And again, like there's nothing particularly mystical about it, except that we asked ourselves, what is the simplest possible way, the cheapest possible way that we could do this at scale and, uh, and then set out to, you know, basically solve the technical problems and figure out how to do it, which we did. Now, one question I have about optimization is the problem with this, you can only run it maybe about 12 hours a day because that's, that's right. Yeah. That's, when that's why it has up. to be cheap. Yeah. But yeah. are there, are there some steps in there that take so long that you can like the energy intensive part, you can do that up ahead. Like I imagine like the electrolytes, mm. like you said, store a lot of hydrogen and now the reactor, maybe that takes a little bit of time or maybe pulling the CO2 yeah. takes out a little bit of time and you can sort of balance the whole thing. So you really are running 24 seven but you're not having yeah. one of them kind of waiting on the other. It's like, oh, okay, we don't have to wait for the sun to come up. We can still keep on producing everything. Yeah, so actually decoupling the three systems um, mm -hmm. is is a key to making them simpler so that like the, the second by second productivity doesn't matter all that much. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we, we, we ran the trade on like, oh, is it is it cheaper to have uh, a giant hydrogen storage shed, basically a giant shed with like a, the world's worst Zeppelin inside uh, that inflates and deflates every day? Um, or is it cheaper just to make the reactor four times bigger and only operate it, you know, at, at well, maybe mm -hmm. twice the size, something like basically operate it just during the day when the hydrogen is being generated and then push the methane out the other end into a, into a big gasometer, but like gas storage tank or, or, or into the pipeline, which has, you know, quite a lot of latent capacity. Uh, and it turns out that the, the latter is cheaper. Um, there's only one part of the whole system, which is worthwhile to run 24 hours a day. And that's the, um, the forced yeah. air through the solvent bed, yeah, that's what I was gonna um, say. because, yeah. because the, Otherwise, we'd have to like four x the size of that bed, um, which is you know, quite a lot of area. And and but the main reason is like the electricity required to 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 push a bit of air through there is you know a kilowatt or something. It's it's like less than mm -hmm. about point point one percent of the total, you know, peak energy consumption. But actually, I want to make a broader point here because I know that you're you have listeners across different industries. This this observation doesn't apply only to synthetic fuel. I mean, if you have a, a huge appetite for pain, by all means, go and do synthetic fuel. But um, but actually, like you know, fifteen or twenty major industries use a shitload of energy. Um, Sorry, I'll avoid avoid swearing for you, but uh, but basically use a lot That's of energy, okay. and and cheap solar will um, uh, basically allow us to redo the way we do all these different industries, uh, significantly cheaper, uh, significantly faster payback, uh, more value for our customers, all these things that we that we like uh, that we know and love, and the way that we um, we make that work uh, is twofold. First of all your utilization is going to be lower if you're using solar power because it's only up during the day. On average, it's about 25%. Uh, so, so, you know, that's, that's 12 hours operation, but you know, there's a, there's a morning and then an afternoon. Um, and, uh, and so you, naturally you need to find some way of making your process much cheaper so that you don't get killed uh, on low utilization. Uh, and for us, that's pretty straightforward, but as a rule of thumb, if you can figure out how to make your factory, uh, you know, your, your, your chemical process that say uh, uses a bit more electricity than it otherwise would, or uses electricity instead of, uh, you know, thermal heat, uh, from, from burning gas. Um, so there, there are ways of making this cheaper, but you need to make it about four times cheaper to, to equal out, equal out on the economics. And then the other key thing, which is kind of a more technical challenge is you need to find some way of making a process, uh, friendly with, uh, with ramping up and down. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, we've basically solved those two problems, uh, on, on all three of our subsystems, um, which, uh, in retrospect, I'm really proud about. I have to say, uh, now's a good time for me to, to brag about uh, the, the quality and, and the skill and the hard work of the team that I've been lucky to build here at, at Terraform Industries. Um, I have, you know, obviously worked in a variety of industries, uh, you know, throughout throughout my life with with a whole variety of people, and I really have to say that the Terraform team here they are uh, not just uh, extraordinarily good looking, but um, but also <laughs> just incredibly smart and and dedicated, and um, and the work speaks for itself. Uh, you know, we announced we hit two bucks fifty per kilogram for green hydrogen. Um, that is extraordinary. I think that's almost a factor two better than, than anyone else has announced. Uh, we've hit 250 bucks per ton for CO2, also a factor of two, roughly better than anyone else has announced. Um, and, uh, and then our CapEx costs are, you know, significantly cheaper again, which basically means that, you know, when, when we say two bucks 50, we're saying two bucks 50 and a five year payback, not two bucks 50 and a 50 year payback. And that's, that's really critical for, for scaling this up. So, so I'm, I'm basically, uh, I'm very effusive and super proud of the team, um, uh, team there, but, you know, to go back to the, the industry point, um, if you can, if you can figure out how to, I don't know, make aluminum or magnesium or, or steel or, or, uh, um, fertilizer or, or whatever, uh, some, some other uh, cement for that matter, some other basically very energy intensive, uh, product using extremely cheap electricity, but the electricity is only available uh, during the day, then it's a license to print money. And I'm, I'm actually surprised that I have not seen, you know, I, I know of a number of startups in this area, but you know, I can fit all their founders in a group chat and it doesn't get too busy. So it's like to, to like my, 
my intuition should be there should be hundreds or thousands of companies that are like mm. racing full out to make this work because we've basically already hit the cost basis on solar today. Uh, we don't need any further improvements on solar. We're going to get them, but we don't need them to make this close economically. Yeah. Now, I assume part of your, your process there with the DAC, you say you basically have to run fans. You're probably just using yeah. battery backup for that. So you can be completely yeah. off the grid. You can use yeah, the and, and for the telemetry battery. and stuff you, as well. You know yeah. Do you have a part where you need uh, heating in the reactor and the kiln? So can um, you so actually reactor, use some of the CO, some of the methane that you're using to produce the heat? That's kind of a little bit of a uh, so, feedback. Well, you, you, you could. It turns out that the cheapest heat is just uh, resistive heating. So um, mm -hmm. it seems kind of crazy, but um, you know, I'd say 300 years ago, if you needed heat, the cheapest way is go cut down a tree and then burn it, yep. right? And maybe 100 years ago, the cheapest way of getting heat is uh, dig up some coal and burn it. And maybe 10 years ago, the cheapest way of getting heat is, uh, is dig up some natural gas and burn it. Um, and uh, at no point, unfortunately, has it been cheaper to get heat um, by by getting like fancy spicy rocks, um, you know, uranium or something, and, and having them get hot. Uh, except for very particular applications, obviously. If you need air independent propulsion for submarines, that's that's a that's a no brainer. Um, but um, but the crazy thing is, as of a couple of years ago, the cheapest way of getting heat right now is take a solar PV panel and run it through a resistor. Yeah, which which seems insane. Like, how could that possibly yeah. be cheaper than picking up a, a a coal rock from the ground and setting it on fire? But it turns out it actually is. Um, and there's a, a number of startups in this space, um, which I think are super interesting, which have basically recognized the fact that um, it's going to be really hard to make a chemical battery cheaper than just a big pile of bricks that you get really hot by dumping solar PV power through them, either daily or seasonally. And then uh, if the pile of bricks is big enough, you don't even need to insulate it. It's just going to stay hot because of the square cube law. And then you can you can get heat out of it, you know, by by blowing air through it or, or whatever. Um, so if you need to, for example, like you want to solve the seasonal problem for, for heating in New England with solar panels. Well, the days are long in summer, so you can just have solar panels out there that are just like literally shorting out through through giant dumb resistors, heating up, you know, football field sized uh, blocks of uh, you know or, or assemblage assemblages of, of of slightly conducted bricks to you know twelve fourteen hundred Celsius, um, and then and then that'll stay hot for like five years, right? And if you need to heat your home, you just blow some air through it, and, and problem solved. And the crazy thing is, you can actually um, it's relatively inexpensive to run a chilling or cooling system uh, with the same technology. So um, so for example, you needed to run chillers twenty four hours a day on a data center or something. Probably the easiest way to do that, um, to my knowledge, is, is with a um, a giant thermal storage system. Uh, you obviously need electricity storage to run the um, the, the computers themselves, but for the for the cooling, which might be forty percent of the total energy consumption, you can do that with thermal storage as well. Um, so that, you know, I, I know of a number of startups in that in that area as well. I think it's a super exciting application uh, for us. Um, we don't we don't really need to store heat overnight, so um, that's not a major problem for us. Uh, the, the kiln the kiln is so power pumps? intensive that it can it heats up what, super fast. What, what about the heat pump? Make any sense for the heat for us, that you no. need, or is it it's too hot? No. too hot for it to be. Efficient. Yeah. So first of all, it needs to be super hot, and the second reason is. Um, is heat pumps are more energy efficient, but actually, if you look at our playbook, it's all about uh, throwing away energy efficiency to save money, mm -hmm. um, and and that's basically true across the board. And actually, you know, I think that that installing heat pumps in houses uh, as an alternative to air conditioning and and, uh, and gas heating or something is is definitely advantageous in terms of uh, air pollution and, and uh, energy usage in areas like in in areas or places where you have true electricity scarcity, and that's projected forward. But you know, if we end up with rooftop solar. Uh, you know, forty-five percent efficiency with you know perovskite tandem cells in twenty or thirty years. Like, it's very likely to me, and even even without that, like, no miracles required. Uh, it seems very likely to me that the assumptions that underlie, you know, the the value prop saying, well, this heat pump's super expensive, but it'll pay for itself in twenty years, assuming electricity prices continue to go up, um, will no longer be true because electricity prices won't go up, and you'll end up with basically you know a piece of machinery that uh, is 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 relatively expensive, um, uh, and and is not actually not in, not in fact paying for itself. Um, it's uh, okay. you know, I think it's. So so if yeah, I just I think back up for if a second. You had to, if you had to electrify, yeah. if you had to purely electrify everything and you didn't have ultra cheap solar, which is kind of the position we thought we were in in 2015, right? Then then heat pumps are a no-brainer. Like that's that's an obvious thing we should do. Uh, and I think it's a you know it's a very robust industry there. But I also think that we should probably adjust our assumptions and 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 boundary conditions because solar has gotten so cheap and because it's continuing to get so cheap and really see like how that changes things. Uh, because because like Again, like the really exciting thing about this is without cheap solar, we can probably mostly decarbonize and probably mostly not starve, right? So like good news, you know, technology will save us. With cheap solar, we can get rich enough that we all have private jets. Like maybe not in my lifetime, but like like <laughs> like that that's that's the upside, right? Like that's that's like, oh, not only do we do we save the penguins and stop melting the ice and clear up our air pollution and so on, but we've also now found a way to increase our GDP per capita to like a million dollars or something like that. And actually, you know. 
depending on how long you live, we're, maybe Ozan and I um, will we'll get we'll get really lucky and like eat nothing but kale. Like we'll actually live to see that. Um, it's it's a um, you know like that, but that, that, that possibility is that, that that cannot occur if if we are if we're stuck you know behind um, you know legacy old technology you know four hundred dollars per megawatt hour uh, green electricity or something like that. It, we just simply we can't get that. Okay, Stop. So for, so me just to, yeah. Well, what I just want to do is, is point out one thing is that uh, the reason you use resistive heating because there's another way to heat stuff up, and that is like you know you just put uh, solar heaters on the top of your house that will make yeah. water warm that you can use to heat your pool or your bath water or something like that. Of course, yeah. The problem is it only gets up to a certain temperature, unless you use like you know magnification and stuff like that to make things super, Even super then. hot. You're only going to get to a certain temperature, but as soon as you turn electricity. You say you can get resistive heating where you suddenly you can get things that are really hot that will start setting things on fire. So the idea is that you want those yep. bricks to get really hot. You don't want them to be lukewarm. You want them to be hot. So it's yeah, not easy so to do it just what, by running water through pipes. And it's not easy doing it with um, a heat pump. Really, the best way is to do it. And, and that's why we're kind of like trying to get ahead around it. It's like, well, wait a minute. Just put the bricks out in the sun and just heat them up and then throw them in your football field. And you're like, no, 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 no. We got to get them really, really hot. The only way to get them really, yeah, really if hot. You, if you need high-grade process heat. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of energy storage, right, if you're just storing heat mm -hmm. and you only need it to heat your house, well, it doesn't really matter if it's 100 Celsius or 1,200 Celsius, right? You can, mm -hmm. like, the, the, the land is cheap. You just have a bigger storage field and, and it's fine. But if, you, if you're storing heat for, you know, like, later on high-efficiency conversion into other forms, uh, then, then you get killed by, um, by kind of inefficiency if, you're, if your hot side is is not hot enough. And actually that's like mm -hmm. the major weakness of the Brayton cycle. So, so if we think about electricity generation today, it's almost always like burn coal, burn gas, burn oil, uh, you know, burn rocks and make, you know, nuclear power and you're boiling water to make steam. And the steam is, you know, 300 odd Celsius and you're running that through a turbine. And with a combined cycle thing, you're also running the exhaust of the, of the gas burning through a turbine. Um, and it's a jet engine essentially. And, and then that makes the, uh, make, and it runs through a generator to make electricity. And that's called a Brayton cycle. So you're basically heating water and cooling it down again. And, uh, it's like, it's, it's fundamentally quite expensive, like, you know, 30 to 35 bucks a megawatt hour just to run one of those things, regardless of your heat source. Um, because, uh, just because of like the, the cost and complexity of a, of a turbine and, and dealing with that. But, but if you wanted to achieve like much higher efficiency, this was tried in the fifties and sixties. Like they actually tried to make uh, coal fired, uh, like in gas fired power plants, like maybe 50 or 60% efficient by increasing the temperatures and pressures to, you know, you know, maybe 40 or 50 atmospheres, kind of like rocket engine type engineering. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that, that, that like it didn't pencil out, like you end up losing money. Um, uh, overall because the, the 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 engineering cost increases exponentially with with temperature um but um but you know if, if you can store energy at, at 12 or 1400 celsius uh using using basically you know hot bricks and and uh minimally conductive bricks or something like that uh, maybe even a little hotter than that if you're using silicon carbide um then then that heat's available for, for other uses regardless of um you know essentially regardless of the, the frailty of your of your turbine blades uh and that's that's super useful for for all kinds of applications so for example for uh for making cement the precalcination step occurs at a thousand degrees celsius so if you store that heat uh electrically during the day you can run your calcine at 24 hours a day which is kind of what cement plants need to do um if you're making steel or other metals you need to kind of 12 to 1400 celsius um if you're and actually the last step of, of cement production is like you know 1450 to you know 1500 celsius that one actually it might be difficult to substitute uh burning fuel for that because the the combustion products like the coal ash for example uh is an important chemical constituent of cement although there are startups i know of uh like uh, brimstone for example that are finding ways around that uh, constraint um but um you know but, but uh, even if we just did the dumbest possible thing and took all our existing productive in infrastructure including like uh, blast blast furnaces at 100 years old and just tried to cut it over to you know the, the cheapest dumbest fastest electrical process it would involve a lot of uh, electrically resistive heat i think uh, and, and and more or less local solar in addition to obviously like we can we can provide uh, synthetic natural gas for people who want to buy it but i think you know the question is like what is the cheapest way of making a lot of money uh, doing this and it's it's a mix of these different approaches so, so I'm guessing that for similar reasons, you guys didn't go with like a really hot electrolyzer that uh, where you can use <laughs> waste heat for the uh, Sabatier reactor as well. Then it would, it would... Um, yeah. Also, so you asked about heat heat, heat management before. Yeah. So um, the the reactor itself is exothermic. Um, so it, once, oh, once okay. it gets started, it makes its own heat. It doesn't make a huge amount of heat. Um, it's it's basically combusting hydrogen and CO two, and CO two is the oxidizer, which feels really messed up, but that's how it works. <laughs> um, and um, the the kiln generates a lot of heat, um, obviously uh, at a very high temperature, um, mm -hmm. and the electrolyzer generates um, a lot of. Uh, there's a kilns on the right hand side of that image there, um, and the, the electrolyzer generates a lot of um, uh, generates a lot of heat, but that's at much lower temperature. Obviously, it's basically just in the form of steam. Um, so uh, you know, steam at ambient pressure. Um, 
Yeah, but but for us, basically, we're, we're trying to find the cheapest possible way of building electrolyzer. And it turns out that that all the different tricks that people have done to electrolyze over the last 100 years to try and make them more efficient uh, tend to end up adding more, more cost than they add value uh, under a situation where you've got super cheap electricity. Uh, and so we just basically ripped all those back out and then uh, took what was left over and tried to figure out how to mass produce it uh, without using too much asbestos or other kind of legacy materials. Uh, and also made it, um, I, I guess, like... It's. I don't appreciate this because we basically said, how, how, like, it, it worked the first time when we did it. Like, it wasn't all that hard for us to do. But we figured out how to run electrolyzers directly off solar arrays without power electronics, and that is uh, hugely, tra hugely, hugely transformative because the power electronics in an electrolyzer could easily run you 200, 200 to three hundred bucks a kilowatt, and our electrolyzer cost target is about fifty bucks a kilowatt. So by being by being able to delete that entire you know process completely. Uh, we end up saving, you know, a huge amount of cost uh, with with zero effort, which is which is my favorite thing to do. Um, and and then so what of course, voltage are you guys running at right now? Uh, well, the electrolyzer, I mean, basically, it's it's matched to a, a string of a solar solar PV, which is about six hundred volts. Um, but yeah. the, the cell voltage itself is around two and a half volts. Um, and and you, you can you can change that one way or the other with a fairly trivial design change, uh, depending on whether you want to optimize for lower capex or um, or you know lower lower efficiency. Um, you know, more higher, higher hydrogen productivity it basically comes down to like the, the ratio of the cost of the electricity where you, where you build compared to the cost of the delivered electrolyzer where you build. Um, but, you know, one of the, one of the things that I like to point out on tours is that the fundamental unit of our electrolyzer, which you can see in that image, um, of the electrolyzer is, is a kind of a, a, a specially shaped piece of plastic. Uh, and when, when terraformers are, are doing the, um, you know, like I say 99% of the global uh, oil and gas supply. Um, between us and our competitors and suppliers and, and licensees and so on in, in 20 or 30 years, uh, there will be on the order of trillions of, of that part, which is pretty unusual for like a macroscopic part that you can like hold up in front of you. Um, you know, if you think comparably, like how many car tires have ever been built? It's probably in the tens mm -hmm. of billions. How many spark plugs have ever been built? It's probably in the tens or hundreds of billions. How many, um, in terms of like macroscopic products that you can actually hold in your hand? Um, I don't know, maybe like how many McDonald's French fries? It's probably in the trillions. Um, but um, but in terms of like a fundamental large part that goes into a machine, like it's easy to get into the trillions if you're talking you know, transistors or something, but um, but for a macroscopic part, that's, that's pretty transformative. But like the net present value of that piece of plastic is uh, is way, way, more, way, way, way more than it costs us to to, to, to make uh, because it's it's every day it's generating hydrogen for us, um, which, is, uh, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Roy, maybe you can pull up the uh, uh, that uh, electrolyzer prototype picture. Is that is that where... where... Yeah, see? that one there. Oh, it's it's not okay. super clear, but we have we have a picture of a of an earlier design on our blog. So, uh, check that out. Um, I will is say, it, is I it just... sticking into the into the water there? Uh, is that the... what's, what, what's digging into water? Sorry. Uh, is that is that the piece that's uh, sticking into the water? Uh, uh, it's it's kind of the rectangular blocky thing on the right hand side of the of the yellow uh, trays. That's yeah. the uh, that's the electrolyzer stack. Um, I will okay. say, since we're running low on time here, we are hiring. So if you're a um, a really really cool like high power DC power engineer or uh, you know, chemical controls engineer, uh, do do feel free to reach out. We'll have those job recs up on our website probably later today. Um, uh, but uh, but generally speaking, if you're you know if you know that you're psychotically driven to make make something like this work, uh, we'll probably get on well. Um, and it's it's a fun thing to work on. Well, thanks so much, Casey. I, I really hope you guys. Uh... So I, I'm super impressed that you guys pulled this off. I honestly didn't think that the direct air capture uh, piece was gonna come together. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, it's really hard skeptical, but I, I, I was dubious. And yeah, when that's you the guys announced that you've done it. I was, I was blown away. And I good, <laughs> thank you. And <laughs> it's really hard to do. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, and and I, I wish you guys the best. I um, yeah, I know there are a lot of people who are gonna want to invest too. <laughs> That was that yeah, was the yeah, question I was getting to. It. All right, so so how do we get our meager contributions into this case? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a bit, a bit tricky. Um, but uh, you know, if if you are a accredited investor and and you are accustomed to joining SPVs or something like that, then um, then you know there, there may be an opportunity as we as we kind of uh, finalize Series A probably next month at this rate um, to to join in. Um, but uh, but you know we 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 feel super fortunate to have gotten to work with some some really terrific investors so far who've who've kind of uh, had very very long visions and, and seen the value of what we're doing here. Um, and we we really appreciate their efforts and their contributions. It's uh, it's a huge privilege to be able to to take their capital and, and do something so strange with it. Yeah, it is it is brilliantly transformative and hugely. The, so I two big picture questions, okay? And we we've we've you've spoken at length about energy independence and we've seen the impact of of not having an energy independence um, in geopolitics in mm -hmm. the world that we live in today. What sort of ramifications do you foresee 
um, because if you're going to bring the cost down to well, a negligible amounts, and you, your technology also basically promotes a lot of independence and self-sufficiency, uh, which will have massive implications for the global south as well, not just uh, the first yeah, world. Of course. What sort of global implications and geopolitical implications do you see this uh, having? Well, I mean, by far the best antidote that we know of for poverty is oil access. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we'd be proud to be part of the ongoing story of, of increasing access to, uh, to cheap and useful energy for, for people all over the world. Um, I think that uh, we've, we've, as a species, made tremendous strides, particularly in the last 50 years, in reducing extreme poverty for humans. Um, and I think that it's possible that we could, me we could measure the number of, of, um, of kind of person years of, of grinding poverty to be endured by the human race uh, is now finite. Like, like probably a, a billion person years of, of grinding poverty is left, something like that, which, which is actually, you know, even, even in itself is a, is a massive tragedy, right? It, 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 it breaks my heart. But, but up until, you know, really a couple, couple of decades ago, that number was probably infinite. Probably most of the human population, most of the human race forever will be in, in experiencing abject poverty, you know, the point where they don't have food security, the point where, uh, where, where in, in some cases, particularly in my own family, not that long ago, like quite literally, like, you know, my great, great uncles and so on, like starving to death in childhood. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I think that the sooner we can consign that, uh, that, that kind of a reality of, of, of you know, pre-industrial human existence to the, to the dustbin of history, the, the better. Um, I'm super motivated by, by the prospect of not just uh, doing away with extreme poverty, but actually doing away with poverty entirely uh, and creating material abundance for, for every human, not just the, you know, the, the few of us who are privileged to, to have the opportunity to, to kind of live in the future here in California, um, but, but for everyone. And I think it's, it's within our grasp now. I, I think this is no longer dream, dreamland. We can actually do this, and it's pretty straightforward. All right, and and going forward, so we've we've heard Elon talk about the need for us to be a space-bearing race, just <laughs> to protect the light of consciousness and take it forward. We've talked about the application of your technology here on Earth. Let talk us through what it means for Mars. Yeah, so um, I mean, part of the reason that I that I decided to go and do this was I recognized that I wanted to spend my career working on hardware related to human space exploration, but I just wasn't getting that experience any other way, right? And at the end of the day, if you want to become someone who knows how to manage technical, you know, teams doing stuff, you just have to go and do it. Right. And, and it was pretty clear to me that I'd, I'd missed the boat as far as making, you know, material contributions to, to the Raptor engine or something for SpaceX. But, uh, but, you know, if I was sensible enough, I could probably figure out uh, some way to be part of the, the long-term picture. And I think at Terraform, we're, we're well on the way to doing that. I don't think that the Terraformer as currently conceived will be particularly useful on, on Mars. It has to be localized and customized for that purpose. But I also think that, you know, in, in 10 years time, when, when SpaceX is standing up, you know, their first, you know, five gigawatt uh, synthetic fuel plant and synthetic oil, you know, hydrocarbon plant and, and actually other, other synthetic chemicals as well uh, on Mars that uh, we will be extremely well positioned to be able to contribute materially to that project. Um, and it's kind of our long-term goal uh, to, to be able to be prosperous enough that we can play a significant role in increasing the access of, of millions of people to, to life off Earth. Um, you know, obviously uh, not against their will, um, but um, <laughs> to put, say the least, but actually like, we talked about synthetic natural gas and, and maybe some synthetic oil, but we can make uh, synthetic alcohols, we can make, uh, you know, esters, uh, we can make um, uh, ethers, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of papers doing the rounds right now about synthetic proteins, uh, starches and fats, um, and obviously uh, carbohydrates and hydrocarbons of all kinds. So like, uh, essentially, uh, and I should mention nitrogen molecules as well, so like nitrates and things for, for fertilizer, um, and, and all these things are uh, basically, you know, the, the reactor will look pretty much the same as this one right here. Uh, slightly different temperatures and pressures and catalysts, but but the same inputs and, the, and different outputs, and, and we can essentially make all these things. Um, and, and it'll be absolutely essential to to doing the industrial self sufficiency self sufficiency on Mars. Uh, we'll be we basically being able to to run a chemical plant off a solar array in a box, and um, that's uh, that's what we're here to, to figure out how to do uh, once and for all. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, so much for your time. Time. Let me let me just quickly pull up your social media profile so everybody can reach out to you. Um, this yeah, is yeah. Casey Seahan on uh, on X, and of course uh, Ozan Bellic and Scott is at Going Ballistic Five. It's been such a pleasure, Casey, having you, and uh, also Scott and Ozan. Thank you so much for your time, Casey. Especially, uh, we look forward to a lot more from Terraform Industries. Thank you. Yeah.